All right, very, very fired up today. A uh, little little different spin on things today. As normally, obviously, we have strength coaches on here. And um, this is Sam Macho, and I'll kind of introduce him. But Sam and I have a pretty special relationship where we, we've gotten to know each other really well this past year. And uh, Sam's a, a nine-year NFL vet. This is going to be your 10th year. Is that right? Yep, yep. So it's going to be your 10th year in the NFL. Uh, played at Texas. Is, is just an all-around a great guy. It's um, – Won the Campbell Award as a senior, which is kind of community service, academics, and performance. Um, father, husband, just a, a, a really, really good perspective on things. So I got the opportunity to train Sam um, this past year, and that's what it was. It was an opportunity. It was a, pri a privilege just to get to spend time with you, Sam. And uh, we hit it off right away. But like I said, Sam's got a very good story, which I definitely want him to tell um, at some point during this. But I, also a great perspective. Sam's been coached by so many um, good, bad, and different. He's had so many performance coaches, good, bad, and different. And I just really want to pick his brain. I think this is something that, that in the strength conditioning realm, we don't do enough of is asking athletes, you know, what do you think makes a good coach? Um, what do you, you know, what, what's been the best, the best training philosophy for you. And so to, to, to me, asking a, a 10 year NFL vet, that's a great place to start. And so I think this, this for, for, and Sam, my whole staff is here. My interns are here. Um, and then for anybody watching, I just think it's such a valuable episode because it's a little different spin on things and it's a different perspective and it's a different lens. Obviously, you see things so much differently than we see things. And and uh, the lens that you get to look from is obviously you're looking at us, whereas it, it's a, you know, a, a kind of a 180. So I just want to spend some time on that today, Sam. And, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. No, my no. pleasure, man. That is. So kind of what, what I, I guess uh, a good place to start and I definitely want to get to your story but um, why don't we just why don't we just start there to you uh, as a guy who's been coached by so many if you kind of think about the best or most elite coaches that you've had um, and it can be anything football uh, specific or weight room specific what what qualities and, and to you what's really made the coaches that, that you think are, are the, the elite of the elite what, what puts them in that category for you Yeah, for me, the coaches that I've respected the most and the coaches that I think that I've learned from the most and gravitated toward the most are, it's pretty much three things. Number one, it's the coaches who understand that it's about the player, not about themselves. Um, it's so many coaches, and I'm, I can talk about players if you want, but you ask me about coaches, but it's so many strength coaches who have egos. It's about them and their program and whatever they've got going on. And I've seen that time and time again hurt players at the high school level, at the little league level, at the high school level, at the collegiate level, and at the professional level. I've seen players get injured out for the season. I've seen players do stuff that never would have helped them, um, that actually hurt them, kept them off the field because of a, uh, a, a coach's ego or strength coaches or performance director's ego or like just thought of like, well, no, I know what I'm doing. And there's some truth to that. But the, the, the piece is like that number one piece is understanding that it's about the player, not about you. Um, I mean, literally, that'll take you light years. Like if you just get that as a coach, you're you're 50 percent there. Like you're already like 50 percent ahead of everybody else. Like you're past the median. The me you're there. Um, cause so many people don't, don't even think about that. They just think about, well, it's my program. I'm trying to build up my resume, but they don't understand that by serving, right. And the point number one, by serving, you end up lack of better terms, getting served Uh prime example as a strength coach for the bears. I played for the bears for four years. I'm with Tampa, uh, Buc the Buccaneers. Now there's a coach named Pierre. No, he was one of the assistant strength coaches with the bears and Pierre, not the head strength coach. Not the top assistant. He was like number three or number four on the on the on the pecking order, and he knew his place for lack of better terms because there's you know there's some of that there too, right? The egos, like he knew where he was at, but at the end of the day, he was always trying to help the player within the confines of what his you know his boss would allow him to do. But he was always like, hey, I will help the player, and I love that. Like it, you know, we had, like I grew one of my best years was when I spent off season. I didn't go back to any special facility. I spent off season in Chicago training with Pierre. And if you listen to Pierre's story, he's a guy who should be on this. Uh, he may have already been on, but he's a guy who could be on here as well. He actually trained Robinson Cano for a little bit in a similar type of fashion, right? Hey, man, I'm just here. I'm available if you want some help. And not only did he help me become a better football player, 
Um, he also, we also built this really cool relationship where now I'm like, dude, whatever you need, I got you. And he also was like, dude, Sam, whatever you need, I got you as well. So that's point number one of what makes a great coach. Point number two also is a coach who's going to tell it like it is, right? That's secondly. And I use Pierre as an example and sleeve. You're an example of that as well. I'll start with Pierre though. So Pierre, like everybody who knows me knows I love to talk, right? I literally like, it's my favorite thing to do. Uh, but here's the deal in an NFL locker room and on an NFL schedule, your time to work out and lift and be in the weight room is limited. Like it's capped. You have oodles of meetings and a lot of time like on the practice field and playing games and watching film, but the weight room time is limited. And I didn't think too much of it, right? I was there, we laughed, we joked, we talked, with me and my teammates were working out, whatever. But I hit up Pierre, I said, Hey Pierre, what can I do to get better? I want to get stronger. And he said, Here's the deal, Sam, like, stop talking. Right? Like he said up told me, like, I know like and I don't mean that in any kind of rough bad way i know you love your teammates but here's the deal like there's a time for that right we have 45 minutes dude 45 minutes in some at some teams to get this lift in right talk to him before talk to him after but when you come in here be so focused right so he's kept it real for me and that actually like i said that year i saw some of the biggest gains for me um another way of keeping it real too is like sometimes like a player doesn't know who he can trust right like so just being honest man it's like a lot whether you're uh, high, uh, coaching high schoolers or college players, even professional athletes, you don't always know who to listen to. You got a lot of people in your ear telling you one thing. Are they being honest? And so, like, we have a strength coach who can kind of tell you, hey, man, like, forget what all the other coaches say. Like, you need to get stronger or you need to get faster. Or, hey, man, here's something that I see, right? Matt, you, Steve, you and I talk a lot about, like, just, like, doing A skips, right? That bounce, right? Here's something that I see that you can get better at. Right. Your overall strength. Amazing. Right. But I forget the name you called it. But there was like a, a transitional. Yeah. You, you know, the, what's the name of it? Uh, reactive strength. The reactive strength. Right. Because I know I could bench a ton. I could squat a ton. But football is not about benching and squatting. It's about reacting. So what do we do in our time together? We work on the reactive strength. And so me as a player, I'm like, dude, I can't wait to come back because I know this dude. No, not only is he humble. Right. And he cares about me, but he also he also is willing to tell it like it is, right? Point number two. And then last point is, I would say, a coach who knows what he's talking about, right? A lot of coaches, it's like, you know, we're squatting every day. We're cleaning every day. We're, you know, benching every day. Like, and I, dude, some of the <coughs> the coaches I've respected the most are the ones who said, hey, man, like, we're actually not going to do any dumb, any uh, barbell bench, right? Let's let it, dumbbell bench, right? Whether because of your body or whatever. It's one who said, I had a coach in Chicago, uh, my last year, my last year in Chicago, he cared nothing about like the front side of your body. I don't care about your your pecs, your freaking abs, whatever. It's all about the back side. That was his thing, right? Like your glutes, your hammies, your back. And so we did pull ups. You know, we did a ton of pull ups and a ton of cleans and snatches. He's like, I don't. He's like, that's what makes the great players great. They're strong in their back, and that's what I believe. And obviously, there's a balance, right? But it wasn't like a uh, uh, a pissing contest, right? It wasn't. It wasn't that. It was like I just, I, I know what I'm doing, and I'm gonna follow you, and and um, that's what I believe makes a coach great. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a super cerebral answer, and it doesn't surprise me that you that you have it. I think it's one of the more powerful things is that know what you're doing is is number three. You know, is that like as a player looks at a strength coach they're not looking for a guy who just knows what he's doing and nothing else that, that to you, that that part was, was, was the third there was about putting, putting players first, tell them the truth, be loyal to them, keep it how it is. And then it's, they know what they're doing. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a massively important part. I see a lot of, I see a lot of young coaches who, who want to prove that they know what they're doing first. And if you'd be more worried about, showing and proving them that you just care and you put, you're putting them first. I think you'd probably get a lot further with athletes. Um, what do you think is, cause to me, there, there's a, there's a fine line of, you know, the quote unquote being a player's coach and then doing what's best for the team. There are, there are some things that players don't understand that as a coach you have to do. And it's not always what the players think is, is, is necessarily Right or the best some or, examples. Let's we gonna have this conversation. Let's have this conversation. Give me that, some examples that they understand. Um, I mean, sh anything from from anything from as as big to as as little. I.e., you know, 
player A wants to, you know, not be part of the team meal plan because he's responsible and he can cook he can cook his own meals. But you as a coach know that if you let one player not do something, then you gotta let 25, 30, 40, and then all of a sudden you don't have a training table anymore. So you gotta tell player A, hey, you you have to go to training table. And I know it doesn't make sense to you. I know you can do things the right way, but there's things like that every day in in, in football and in strength and conditioning. But what is the fine line of of being a player's coach, but at the same time, not just letting the players run everything. And at the same time, being that guy that sometimes you got to lay it down and say, this is what we need to do better as a, as a team. No, that's a great question, Sleeve. And that's something I've actually been kind of wrestling with a little bit. Um, Cause at one of the places I've been at, um, so I'm, I'm going on my 10th year, I'm 31 years old, been playing in the NFL, the highest level, for 10 years, been in the playoffs, been a starter. Obviously, I have some injuries, but uh, been a starter for a majority of my career. Um, on some top, top defenses, majority of my career, been around a really some really good players. And as I've gotten older, I have realized, man, like, I know a lot of what my body needs, personally, as an older player. Um, but the flip side is there's some younger players who don't know what they need to eat or whether it's eating or lifting or resting or recovering. And so the tough part is, I know I've experienced it recently when it was like, the coach was like, hey, this is our workout plan. And not even a workout. Let's say it's even like activation or rolling out or whatever. It's like, hey, there's something I've been doing that's been really, really great for my body as a player. Like, it's almost like, please, like, let me do that. You know what I mean? Right. So like, I, I, and it's different, right? It could be different. I, like, I think that's why kind of like knowing your players are really important, you know, Um uh, Cause I think there's a place for, Hey man, like it is what it is. Right. I understand that you're different, but we're a team and there's no exceptions. And it's, there's a place for a player to be like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to fall under this. But I think there's also a place where uh, it's like, Hey, like that whole, it is what it is. Can only go to a certain extent. Cause it's like, dude, if you don't even know, you don't even like, I found out something that, that you're not even teaching me, but you're going to cap me. You're going to keep me from being great. Right. That's kind of what I mean. So, so if you, so if you have a coach who's like, Hey, I'm trying to help you be great. That's different than, in my opinion, that's different than, well, hey, everybody else does it, so you got to do it. And I, 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 I mean, like I said, I was in Tampa, and, and one of the things that it was was like, hey, it was a really young team. And so we had this kind of activation, kind of not activation, but a, a propitiation, I think it was, like before the game or the day before the game where it's like everybody would do some jumps and some quick squats or whatever. Well, I had learned at, at the place at Buffalo when I was with the Bills, um, I learned to, to do that on my own and like some stuff that really worked well for my body, trial and error. And so when it was like, hey, Sam, well, this is the way we do it, I was like, well, dude, like, that doesn't even, like, the stuff that they do for those rookies doesn't even do anything for me. Right. You know? And so there was a ton of back and forth. For me, it was a ton. Of, I had to, like, be bold and say, hey, coach, like, is there space for me to do something like this? And thankfully, because he knew me and whatever, he respected me enough, he said, hey, there's space for that. But, but, but do this as well, right? Just, just for the rookies. You know what I mean? And so sometimes it was like, yeah, I can. Other times it was like, man, like, I'm, I, I got it. I'm the one on the field, right? I got to do what's best for me. And so I think there's a space for that. But it, all that gets usurped when you have a coach who you know he's got your back. Yeah. Right? You know he's got your best interest in mind. And you know that he respects. Like, like it's almost like when my first meeting with you, not even, I wouldn't, we didn't even meet. I was just a little fly on the wall. I walked in, you were, you were finishing up some calls um, with some of your players about, about, either weighing in or taking their protein shakes. And one of the players, I mean, it was like, hey, man, just checking in, right? You didn't you didn't check in at the training table the last couple of days. Is everything okay, right? I didn't hear the other end of the call, but it was like, all right, cool, cool. Make sure you get that done tomorrow, right? Just hang up. And you, I don't know if you know that I know this, but, well, you hung up. The next call, it, you're low-key like, you're like on this dude's head like, hey, dude, there's a different guy, but hey, man, show up, right? <laughs> you can't do that anymore. I'm done. Like, we're done. If you don't show up, like, you're, you know what I mean? And so I was like, for me, I was like, oh, oh, man, like, this dude knows his players, right? If somebody's approaching me, for me, because I'm responsible, whatever, saying, hey, man, you got to show up. Who do you think you are? Da, 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 da. You ain't been in the last two days. I'm like, eh, eh, eh. Yeah. I'm hearing that. Yeah. But if you know me well enough, that's why the first thing was, like, knowing your players and almost, like, having that relationship. If you know me well enough, instead of jumping to your, like, high horse, like, I'm the coach or the player, to say, hey, Sam, the last couple of days you haven't been working out or you haven't been checking in at the training table, drinking your protein shakes, your weights down. Is everything okay? That is night and day. Then, hey, man, you're 
three pounds overweight or six pounds under, you know what I mean? And that happened this year in Tampa, right? Respect, right? Uh, my weight was down a little bit. And instead of them, like, reporting uh, to the head coach or whatever, it's like, hey, man, just wanted to chat with you. Are you good? You know, and I got a chance to have that conversation. So it's almost like I think the best way to put it is respecting your players, right? Respecting your athlete and respecting your position. You have a position as a coach of authority. Don't abuse that. It's like a parent, right? Like you just had a baby, right? You got a little probably what one month old, one month old yep. at home. Um, I got three. I got I got a five year old, three year old, and a one year old, right? A lot of coaches have kids, right? As a father, it's not like hey, do what I say, right? <laughs> It doesn't always – sometimes there's space for that. But other times it's like, hey, man, like, um, I I love you. I know what's best for you. Let's let's try it this way. You know what I mean? So there's there, it's got to be a, some give and take, not just I am the coach. It's my team. It's my position. It's my job on the line. Show up. Because players can read through that. I think to, to me, and I think I mean, you're saying what, what, what – we're on the same page with this. To me, what I think and what I what I preach to to my coaches and my assistants, the people that I come across, is like, yes, there are exceptions, and and I, and I believe if you don't, then then you're on the other line of this. If you're the, it's my way and it's this way and it's this way, no matter what, it's black and white. There is no gray. Now, while in college, it's it, it's got to be a little more like that because of our structure. There are still always exceptions. There's exceptions to any any rule, and that's why I always try to tell you know as I give you know as I've had assistance over the year and I've given them authority where they have either you know really relished or what I think floundered is in that is 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 figuring out what is the right time to make an exception. You know, like like if a guy if a guy who's been struggling to do things the right way for months is all of a sudden on a two week hot streak and seems to be doing really well and doing things, doing, doing everything the right way and forgets to clean his locker one night. That's probably a phone call I make and go, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm not going to tell coach sleeve about this. I clean up your locker tonight. You know, I, I'm not going to give you the easy way out. This isn't the, this is cause I think you've been doing a great job. And I want to keep momentum. I'm going to help you out this one time. Now this is it. I'm not going to give you a crutch again. I'm helping you out this one time. Get your locker, get your locker together. Don't let me find like this again. And what that does for your relationship with that player, instead of getting a phone call from me going, I'll see you at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning because you're messed up, sorry, um, is a complete different world. Okay. And so I think understanding those exceptions is what you're saying. And to me, that's the essential piece of, of that fine line of, of putting the players first and understanding that there, there are exceptions to everything now. It's on a scale, right? You know, you start you start making exceptions to everything. You don't have culture anymore, um, and then vice versa. You make absolutely zero exceptions to anything. You don't have a football team bought into your program. So it's it's kind of that fine line, and, and I, you know, more or less, I think that's that's what you're saying. Yeah, no, definitely, and it's like it's. Um, I agree. I can. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, so just let's. Let's let all that's all that's awesome, Sam. I think that's like I said, it's 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 a different perspective and it's it's seen it out of out of different eyes and it's it's good for us all to hear. And I think it's good for anyone listening to hear. Um and we could probably spend all day talking about that stuff. Um what about some some kind of specific training things and and I know uh, there's a lot of things that are individualized and you and I have talked about this, but what are some things that over I mean you've been training for so long? What are some things that that training wise to you are our pillars that you're like, this has really made a difference in my, and it could be, you know, whatever, whatever you want to talk about. Is, is it what you do sleep wise? Is it nutrition? Is it something specific in the weight room, something specific sprinting, but things that you have found from a training standpoint that have just absolutely changed the game where you're like, man, I wish if I would have known about this, my freshman year at Texas, I could have been the first overall draft. Like w- what are those things that you've really come by that are, this is, this is really what works well for me. Yeah, well, for me, it was mainly a learning is like a learn by experience kind of thing. Like one thing I've, I've known is like for me, I love like running and moving. And so like the hands down, the, the thing that brought me the most uh, benefit. I got to give me one second. My wife is calling me. Um, yeah, for me, one of the biggest things I learned was just almost like always it's like a uh, uh, an object in motion stays in motion, but an object at rest stays at rest. For me, two big learnings were one, like the off day, right? The importance of rest on an off day, but also like rest for me, 
isn't, I'm not, I'm not at my best when I just sit around and don't move at all. Right now, that doesn't mean like, I also like hear, hear what I'm hear, don't hear what I'm not saying. NFL schedule. Usually work six days. We're off one day. Usually working Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, play on Sunday, practice on or you know, meeting stuff on Monday, then off on Tuesday. And so what I found was that when I moved around a little bit on Monday, it felt good. And then Tuesday, just like 15 minutes of moving around, um, I would use a, a like a 10 pound medicine ball or, and, and do like a thousand, you know, throws in some way, shape or form. Right. We got up to a thousand. Right. So we started like 200, then went up to like 400 and then six. And, you know what I mean, so then it got up to that. But it ended up like ended up being 15 minutes of work. Yeah. Just that alone made me better for Wednesday's practice. Yeah. And Thursday and Friday. And then part, you know, that's 1A. And 1B was kind of a similar mindset. You know, Saturdays are usually a walkthrough before our games. And I think it just goes back with that, like, propitiation, like, getting your body, keeping your body awake. I found that, and I learned this from a guy named Lorenzo Alexander, who's played, he played 15 years in the NFL, most recently with the Buffalo Bills. Like, pro bowler, the whole deal, right? He's done it all. And for him, I, I saw him on a Saturday before a game, like, doing – like jump squats, like squats, not heavy, but just like jump in, like explosive, whatever. And I, I, I kind of picked not even his brain, the coach that was training him, another one of those coaches, um, Will, y'all know Will, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, from the Bills. And he was telling me about why Zo does what he does, right? Keeping his body awake, ten minutes, five, ten minutes, and so, and so I started to do that, and I did it in my own way, um, of just explosion, right? Just little things to keep me explosive. Um, that would be one A and and one B of what I of what I learned was super um, super effective. Man, okay. Now on the other end of the spectrum, what are some things Hallelujah. that either you've done you've done ill will or you have been instructed to do that you're just like, man, if I could tell a strength coach to never do this to their athletes, what would those things be? Heavy benching, period. <laughs> <laughs> like benching in general, and maybe because maybe because I'm not the best bencher, right? My I got other stuff that I'm stronger at, but still, like like at least in football, like when are you ever on your back pushing someone up over? You know what I mean? Like like it to me, it makes zero sense. To me, that's like where it's like, hey, like what are different ways? Like of course you need the general strength and the overall strength, but like <laughs> the best benchers have oftentimes on our teams have oftentimes been the worst players. Or that the heaviest squad, like the guys who broke all the weight room records, right? There have been a time or two where they were the best, but oftentimes they were they didn't even play on the field. Didn't even play on the field, yet they were squatting six, seven hundred, or benching four fifty, uh, almost five hundred, right? And there are also obviously exceptions. <laughs> you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. You have to have a certain level of strength to do anything, but I think it gets overly weighted in the wrong direction. You know I mean, we've got a bench every day and we got a squat every day. Now, you know what I mean? Like now cleaning, I think it's totally different. Power cleans, hang cleans, snatches, um, all those explosive movements are different because as a football player, it's not about moving statically. It's about moving explosively and moving in space, right? We had a guy who taught us like the, uh, like three dimensions of movement, three planes of movement. So in college, I was all, I was squat. I was squatting heavy and cleaning heavy and, and everything, you know, and benching heavy, doing it all. But and I played defensive, defensive line, defensive end. It was kind of my job description. But I didn't know how to move in space. And as an NFL linebacker, you need to know how to move in space. And and so for me, it was almost like this deal of like, oh man, how do I figure out how to move in space? And there's a balance as well, right? You don't want to lose your strength. You don't want to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul. But um, I think coaches put too much stock in. How much do we bench? And and, and and I think it's for the birds, personally. Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably why you 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 enjoyed your time with me a little bit. But I mean, that's the the further I get in my career, and I and I don't completely agree with everything you're saying, which is okay. But movement is king, and if you can't move, it doesn't matter what you do in the weight room. And as in my opinion, as a strength and conditioning profession, we are still way too heavy in the weight room and not nearly enough work on the field with like the reactive things that, that, that I worked on with you. And we are missing the boat there. Whereas like, you know, most people who come and look at our program, they're like, man, where's all your weight room volume. And I'm like, it's between the lines in that field house. Go look at it. Like that's, that's where we get our, 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 our the, the brunt of our work and the brunt of our load. Cause we need to be good movers. Um, but to, to that point, Sam is 
I think another good point to strength coach is to understand that just like Sam Macho doesn't like heavy benching, there's a hundred athletes on a team that don't like something you do in the weight room. And you have to understand that too. And understand that teaching them why you do it or why you're asking them to do it is very important because they may, they may not like it, but at least if they understand your why they can buy into it. So I got understanding that. I yeah. Got Let's say uh-huh. we were benching super heavy, right? Not heavy, but just benching a ton. And it's like, Hey, I don't think this helps. And, 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 and it's like, give me your why of why are we benching this much or whatever. Right. Oftentimes coaches, I know I asked you a question, but I'm answering it. But if that's okay, oftentimes <laughs> coaches will be like, I mean, they don't say it, but essentially it's like, cause I said, like I'm the coach. You know what yep. I mean? You don't even have the space. Players don't even have the space to ask why you just do it. You know what yep. I mean? So like, what do you tell a player? And like, and like, this is my, my big, I'm not, not even a soapbox, but like, what do you tell a player who's um, doing all your know, bench and have you, you know, as a coach in your experience, it, we need to move more on the field. But you've got coaches. I had one in, in the NFL who was all about squatting and heavy, and clean and heavy every all the time, right? And then going in the sand pit and doing jumps and whatever. And guys be like, I don't feel good. And one guy like tore his ACL in the off season because of doing that, right? And that's just one example. I'm not, you know, I'm trying to make that a big point. But, but you know, what do you tell a guy who who knows better, for lack of better terms, or thinks he knows better, maybe? And, the, and like to tell the coach, hey, is there a different way? No, nah, little kid, you know, sit down, straight up. And then part two is like, let's, it's kind of 1A, right? But let's say you're at a place where like the coach isn't even trying to, you know, what do you tell a player to do if the coach is not listening and not trying to advance, yeah. not trying to, you know? I mean, I think uh, one, there are similarities <laughs> obviously in college and NFL, but it, it, it's apples and oranges in a lot of ways. I would train an NFL team. 100% differently than I would train a, a college football team. One, you're, you're right. And in the NFL, guys are super aware of their bodies. So what you're coining, that term space, that that area would be significantly larger than what, what we do, you know, in the college level. Now, just like if you look at our freshmen versus our upperclassmen, that space is much larger. When you come in here as a freshman, you need to develop general strength. There's general things that I know you need to do. And you don't know your body. Like, you come in as a freshman, you really don't. You come and tell me that you're – you come and say, hey, coach, my quad hurts. And I'm like, no, dude, it's your psoas. Like, it's not – you don't even know which muscles hurt. So let me worry about that right now. But if you come and look at our program with our juniors and seniors, I know those guys know, like, at the end of the day – Maybe a lunge hurts your knee, and I don't know why it necessarily hurts your knee. Could be something to do with anatomy. It could be something I'm not seeing. But I know that if every time you say, hey, every time I've lunged the last two years, my knee hurts for four days, we're not going to lunge. Like, I'm going to find a different movement for you that doesn't do that. And I think that's the thing is, like, you're always going to train around. Like, I don't, I don't ever want to train with pain. Yes. That, and those are the gonna... coaches the most. That right there, what you just said. In a nutshell, those are the coaches I've respected the most, right? Hey, man, this is kind of hurting me. And not even, I mean, not even like it's oh, push through it and get better. But it's like, dude, like I've been like, I got, I, I, I work out and I limping up out practice because of this, you know? So, hey, let's find a way to actually make you better, not just implement my agenda. Yeah, so no. Like, that'll fall on their ears. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and that's kind of the, it, it goes back to the very first thing we talked about, and that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the difference a lot, right. Is, is, is some coaches. And I think, I think the thing is, is like, it's, to me, it's a question of confidence in a lot of standpoints is, is sometimes, sometimes coaches aren't always the most confident. You know, a lot of times coaches are, are people who weren't as, I mean, I was a division three football player. I wasn't an NFL football player. And a lot of times I think coaches are trying to prove something or their confidence might not really be, what it is and so it's like how dare you question me you know where it's like that ain't what it's about we're both here at the end of the day we have to have the same goal me and you have the same goal to do what get better win championships become better human beings and if that's our goal there is no ego there which you talked about as well and i think we're getting better as a profession but there's certainly pieces of that that we can learn from um all right so we've kind of gone through your eyes looking at coaches we've gone through your eyes looking at training now let's go kind of the team perspective here i want you to think about the best teams you've ever played on and and think more so like in the locker room behind closed doors or things that didn't involve coaches what are things that 
that separated that team that made that you, you'd look at that team. What did that team have that the, the mediocre or bad teams didn't have that you played on? Yeah. Three, that's, um, three, let me not say that's easy, but um, three things, competent competition, um, leadership and accountability. And this is literally within the players, not take out all the coaches or whatever. Prime example, competition. So my junior year, at te- I went to the university of Texas, even though I am repping the uh, Buffalo Bulls. Yeah. I mean, shout out hardly home, but always repping. Thanks for the shirt sleeve. Um, at UT in 2009, we went to the national championship. Played out. We were 13 and 0. Uh, won the Big 12 championship. Went to the national championship. Played Alabama. In 2008, the year before, we were 12 and 1, and we were. It was a three-way tie for the Big 12 champions between us, Texas Tech, and Oklahoma. We were all 12 and 1, and we had beaten Oklahoma. Um, but Oklahoma beat Tech and Tech beat us. And so saying that the they had that BCS rating system and we were like 0.029 away from being in the national championship game. And, and Oklahoma went and they lost and, you know, and we went to the Fiesta Bowl and won that and beat Ohio State. And, and that was cool and great and dandy. Well, the next year, like we were so driven as players, like this is that competition, the accountability and leadership all in one. Like we like competed every single day, every single day. Like, nope, the standard was the standard. And it's one thing for a coach to tell you about the standard, but it's another thing for one of your peers to say, hey, man, this is our standard. And not and not even in front of a coach, not to show, because some people do it for power, not for power, not for, no, this is our standard, dude. The st- run it again. Hey, hey, start that drill over, right? That's powerful when you, that's coming from one of your players. And now when that's the culture, right? So that, so that's that, like, that's almost like the accountability piece and even the leadership in one. But the competition of, like, hey, we're going to get better. That same year, um, we've been doing this for a while, but um, we got together on our own and did our own, like, kind of seven-on-seven seven on Thursday nights. We'd get together and do our own seven-on-seven seven stuff, our players, right? DBs and wide receivers would have theirs. O-line and D-line would have theirs. No coaches, no nothing, but we would just do it together, right? So it's like, it's like this culture of, like, we, want to, we wanted to be great. A similar thing happened um, in Arizona. Uh, my my first couple years in Arizona with the Cardinals, excuse me, we weren't we were you know five and eleven, eight and eight, or really eight and eight. My first year, five and eleven. The next year, we brought in a new coach, and and his name was Bruce Arians. But his biggest things were like trust, loyalty, and respect. Right, building a culture there. And that year, we went from five and eleven to ten and six. Right, and the next year, we went to eleven and five. Went to the playoffs. Cam Newton went and played uh, the Panthers in the in the playoffs. Um, you know, I had and I had a sack fumble in that game. Like, it was like I, I played well in that game. But it was because we had this culture of everyone keeping each other accountable. <clears throat> everyone kept each other accountable. And so <clears throat> it didn't take a coach telling you you were doing something wrong or telling you to run the ball. It was the players keeping each other accountable, right? And obviously, you're, the competition, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious what it, what's there. But then the leadership factor as well, there as well, right? B.A., Bruce Arians was a great leader. And I, I believe, I guess it's two things, but I believe that leadership starts from the top. Right, your reflection of the people above you. So look at the people to your like flanking you to your left and to your right. They're gonna only they're only gonna be as good as you are. But at the same time, it doesn't you don't have to be at the top to lead. Right? You can lead from behind. So like so those are the kind of the big things that I saw, right? Like this competition, right? This this accountability, leadership. If you want to add a I'm not gonna add a fourth, but there but like all of those three things develop a sense of camaraderie. And, like, once you're a team, because a lot of times it's one thing to have five individuals or 11, but once you become a team, like, you can't be broken apart. So you walk into a room, right? Maybe it's a, a newer team. Maybe it's a team you've been there. Let's say you've been there for a while, a couple years. You start kind of a new season, new off season, and, and the first thing you notice in your head, Sam Macho's head, is, man, we're not competing very hard. These guys aren't competing very much. What do you do as a player – because I just had a player ask, ask me this the other day. What do you do as a player to make that a competitive environment? Like, what, what is the first thing you're like, what, what, is, what does Sam Otto have to do to get this thing rolling? Yeah. Shoot, I got to be honest with you. Like, that was something I was uh, – I'm trying to get better at that, put it that way. You know, because a lot of times I can see the problem. It's one thing to see it, nothing to actually solve it. And I saw that. I went from – so – Arizona, right? My last year, we were 11 and five and playoffs, the whole deal. Um, but I and my, my contract ended. I ended up signing with the Bears the next year, and the Bears were 
like back at the bottom. They were they had, they were the thirty second ranked defense, and I played out linebacker th- th- that year. The year before they were thirty one, so they weren't getting any better. They're actually getting worse. You couldn't get any worse than what they were. And the culture there, it was like zero. Guys didn't believe in themselves. Not even if they weren't even competing, they didn't even believe that they were good. And so for me, I saw that, and so it was like, you know, I, what I guess what I wish I would have done is I wish at that point, moment to answer your question, like what would you, what would I tell that player is like. I'm gonna say this, and it's not. I'm gonna say this, but with a caveat. What I would say is that you can create the culture. But a major, and, and what I mean by that is like, if they're not competing, you compete every day, right? If they're going half speed, you go full speed every day. And I've seen guys, I saw Khalil Mack do that in Chicago. Like he created, not that we were going half speed, but he, he set the tone every single day. So you, you can create the culture. But there also could be a caveat. Oftentimes, if you're the only guy doing it, or if you're not like the big name guy, it may not always be as effective, right? What I've learned in my time is that uh, bad as it is to say, or we'll call it what it is, players want to listen to the ones who are producing on the field. So don't come tell me about leadership if you're riding the bench. And that's what I've seen in my profession, right? Don't come to me, don't come and tell me how to be great and you don't even know how to tackle somebody or catch a pass or whatever. You know what I mean? And that's not to yeah. denounce um, a guy like leaders are leaders. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. But like there's a both end, right? For me, it was like, man, I want to talk. But before I talk, I got to actually show these guys what I can do so that they can listen. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's persistency. It's, it's as a leader, you have a lot of jobs and you wear a lot of hats. One of those jobs is not giving up. You know, like you, you, you're, so I, I'll tell every athlete I coach is, I will never give up on you and I am always going to be more hard-headed than you, I promise. So you can try as many different ways as you want, but I will, I will outlast you, I promise. I will I will find a way to be more hard headed than you are because I think this is what's gonna make you a better teammate, man, husband, father, whatever it may be. And that's the same advice I would give players on that. Is it's just what you said. It's it's okay, you're not gonna compete. Let me show you. And I'm gonna and I'm never gonna fall into what you're doing. I'm just gonna keep competing my ass off every day and I'm gonna tell you about it. So watch me work and don't think I'm going anywhere because I'm gonna be in your kitchen every day all day until you decide to meet this standard and to me that's that's what really changes things because at the end of the day guys are going to get on on board eventually because nobody likes to stand out that much and if you make a guy really stand out like you know if khalil you're talking about khalil mack if he's doing a certain level of something and you're so far away from that level nobody wants to be that guy that's that's sticking out the wrong way so naturally what's the group going to do they're going to find a way to get closer to that the, the cream of the crop so no, I think that's a that's a that's a good point. Well, Sam, I, I know how how busy you are, and I know you got family, kids, and wife, and everything. So I don't want to eat up too much of your time. But this has been this has been awesome. It's been everything that I that I, I hoped it would be, and I really hope people take time to to watch and listen to the message because there's a lot of really really valuable things um, about this. And uh, you know, I appreciate you. I appreciate you as a friend. I appreciate you as a human being. So keep it the great work, man. You're you're changing the world one day at a time, and I appreciate everything you uh, you do, man. I definitely appreciate it, Sleeve. And congrats on that baby, man. Hey, I appreciate you, man. All right, bro, we'll talk soon. All right, for sure. Bye.